All right, um, let's go ahead and get started. Um, welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. As usual, I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. <clears throat> um, so tonight, um, the theme for tonight, or what we'll kind of be talking about, we're going to be talking about kind of what it means to sit under the Bodhi tree. Or what, what does it mean to sit under the tree of enlightenment? So if you've been coming to Dharma Doors lately, you know that we've been kind of exploring the life story of the Buddha, but we've been exploring the life story of the Buddha using the sutra, the Upaya Sutra that we've been reading now for, for a while. And we're, we've been in this section now for a while where the sutra is recalling the important moments in the life story of the Buddha that kind of led to the Buddha's enlightenment. And so a few weeks ago, we were dealing with the birth of the Bodhisattva, so the birth of the being that would become a Buddha. <clears throat> and then last week, we talked about leaving home. Now, if you were here last week or the week before, you'll know that what we're doing here, though, is things are a little different in this sutra because the life story of the Buddha is not being presented as historical events. This is sort of doing a couple of things. So one thing, and this is the main thing that the sutra is doing, the main thing that the sutra is doing is representing, so representing the life story of the Buddha, but in a way where it was all just a magical display, a, an upaya. And so it wasn't that any of these things, even like being born or having a wife, having a child, all of these things were only, it only appeared as if the Buddha was doing these things. Now, I, I won't get too into this, but I do want to just create a little bit of context. What the sutra is sort of doing is it's accounting for the fact that the bodhisattva before becoming a Buddha, the Bodhisattva had a wife <laughs> and a child, and so was therefore participating in the sensual pleasures. And so this sutra is sort of basically saying, no, the Buddha wasn't really indulging in sensual pleasures. It just appeared that way as an upaya because he wanted everybody to feel like he was just like one of us. <laughs> in that way. So that's sort of the way that the sutra is presenting the life story of the Buddha. But then there's been sort of me and Dharma doors here. And what I've been doing lately, like the last many months, is I've been exploring in Dharma doors the Bodhisattva path, kind of what it means to be a Bodhisattva. And what I've been presenting is that you can kind of read the life story of the Buddha as an archetypal journey of a bodhisattva. And so, for example, last week, we talked about how historically, it's the life story of the Buddha. One important moment is when the Buddha leaves home, right? Renounces the palace, renounces his family, and goes and becomes a wanderer. Now, that's part of the life story of the Buddha, but as I presented it last week, the idea is, is that it's an archetypal moment in the journey of all bodhisattvas that they will, at some point, leave home. But then also, one of the things I was you know, making clear last week, in the Mahayana Buddhist tradition, in the bodhisattva path, leaving home doesn't necessarily mean 
shaving your head and wearing robes and being a monastic in the Mahayana tradition leaving home is defined as relinquishing attachment to home as a possession as ownership relinquishing attachment to the creature comforts as something that you need in order to be comfortable and so the idea is is that what it or the way I was presenting this last week is that at, at a certain moment on the bodhisattva journey they release attachment to the things of the world and as I was mentioning it last week it's sort of about the bodhisattva being sated being being like I've had enough of the world I'm good I'm good on that and now I'm moving on to kind of you know call them more spiritual things or cultivation or practice so now that we've left home or at least now that we know what it means to leave home as a bodhisattva that brings us to the next major moment in the life of a bodhisattva which is the moment when they sit under the Bodhi tree and become awakened Buddhas. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, I am going to read from the sutra. Uh, it happens to be Easter Sunday, which is sort of, um, it's kind of actually interesting. I was debating about whether I would mention this or not. I think this is interesting. I don't really have a lot to say about this, but you know, I would not be the first person to make a comparison between the resurrection story of Jesus and the sort of the enlightenment story of the Buddha. A comparison has been made before. Interestingly, if you read the New Testament and you sort of read it in kind of Greek or kind of a more original language like Aramaic, seemingly when they talk about Jesus being crucified on a cross, if you read the New Testament, though, it actually says he was nailed to a tree. Now, and there's a lot of biblical scholars that analyze that and kind of try to make it that it wasn't a real tree, it was the cross that was made out of a tree. But regardless, the point is, is that a tree, whether it's in, you know, been turned into planks and a cross or whether it's an actual tree, a tree is instrumental in both kind of transformation stories, transformation story of Jesus, transformation story of the Buddha. And as we're going to kind of learn tonight, or we're going to read about a big, you know, an, an aspect of being a Buddha, of being an awakened being, an aspect of that transformation is overcoming death, like overcoming Mara. That's what we're going to learn about. Well, a lot of people interpret the Jesus resurrection as an overcoming of death, a, a spiritual transformation story about transcending the human state, which is marked by mortality, to a spiritual state that is immortal in some sense. So there's some interesting parallels. Again, I'm not going to dwell too long on this, but I just think it's kind of um, uh, fortuitous that it should be Easter and we should be talking about the Enlightenment story of the Buddha. So, with that in the back of our minds, uh, let's dive in. Uh, as usual, we're reading from the Treasury of Mahayana Sutras. I'm on page 452. This is actually going to be the beginning of section three of the sutra, or at least the way that the sutra is divided here. So let's find out. And, and once again, as we read this, let's be thinking about this as a archetypal journey that all of us might go through at some point if if we're on the bodhisattva path so 
The next question, and it, you, were, you will recall that all of these are being asked like, but, but why did the Buddha leave home in the middle of the night? Why did the Buddha do this? Why did the Buddha do that? Well, our next question is, why did the Bodhisattva reach the Bodhi tree when he had eaten and was full of energy, not when he was emaciated and weak? So this is, of course, <clears throat> another one of those important moments in the life story of the Buddha. And what it is, is that, and it, if you don't know the life story of the Buddha, I want to just clarify. So the idea was, is that Siddhartha, when he left home and took up um, life as an ascetic, and he was studying under first a master named Alara Kalama, and then afterwards he studied with a master called Ramaputra. But then he decided to go alone. He actually, his last teacher, Ramaputra, he actually surpassed Ramaputra and Ramaputra became Siddhartha's student. So at that point, Siddhartha thinking, wow, if I'm your teacher, then I don't have anything more to learn from you in that way. And so that's when the Buddha decided to go alone. Now, up to this point in the story of Siddhartha, the Buddha, or I should say Siddhartha, the Bodhisattva, had been practicing what are just called austerities. And austerities are things like wandering rather than having shelter. They are things like fasting rather than eating. And so the, the, the Bodhisattva Siddhartha had been fasting. And the story is that actually he had been fasting for so long that he had become completely emaciated. And it was in this state of total emaciation that, well, I'll tell you the whole story because it's, it's an interesting backstory. If, again, if you haven't heard it. So the Buddha sitting there emaciated, having kind of surpassed all of his teachers and all of his teachers up to that point had been pre prescribing, if you will, that the way that you get liberated, the way to moksha, to liberation, is through a kind of suppression of the body. So whatever it is, the body wants to have sex, suppress it. The body wants to sleep, stay awake. The body wants to eat, starve yourself. The body wants that, don't give it. And it was sort of a process through the austerities of mastering the body by denying it all of the things that it would want, a sort of you know, uh, a cleansing of the wanting, but through removal. So the Buddha was in that state of total renunciation of everything. And in that state, the story goes that he was sitting by the side of a river and there was a, a, a band of mu musicians that were floating by on a, on a little boat. And the musicians were all tuning their instruments. And the story is, is that Siddhartha saw one of the musicians tuning a stringed instrument. And he was watching, as they were floating by, he was watching the person string and tune the instrument. And he noticed that when he first put the string in and pulled it, it was flip, 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 flip. It was very loose. And so he wound and tightened the wire, the, the string, and it was doot, 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 boop, boop, boop. And then he tightened it a little too tight. And when he plucked it, the string snapped. And they say the story is, is that it was at that moment 
that Siddhartha had a realization about what would become known as the middle way or the middle path. And the story explains it that the Buddha compared his life in the palace with everything that he ever wanted, being able to eat as much as he wanted all the time. Well, that was like the string of the instrument being too loose. And what he realized was that in that state of emaciated starvation, it was as if the string were too tight and it was about to break. And so the realization of the middle path is about this kind of treating our body like a musical instrument that needs to be tuned. And if the tuning is too slack, if it's too loose, then the analogy is, is that there's like a note. There's like a musical note that our life, our body could, would, would ring. And if our lifestyle is too indulgent in that way, then our, our instrument is too loose. And so the note, the note that we are sounding is off, it's out of tune, it's too loose. Or that could be too tight. And what the Siddhartha, what the Bodhisattva seems to have realized is that it's actually about striking a delicate balance, that middle path where the note or I should say the string of our body is tuned just right so that we are in tune. <laughs> and so it's not being not too slack, not too tight in that way. So the story goes, again, I'm giving you the backstory of this. The story goes that in that emaciated state, the Buddha was leaning against a tree. This is not the Bodhi tree. This is just a tree by the side of the river where he saw the music musicians. And the, the idea is, is that the Siddhartha had become so emaciated and he was, there's a version of the story where he had been kind of resting on this tree for so long that the vines and the roots started to grow around the Buddha or around Siddhartha. And so he was this emaciated figure covered in the, in the vines and the root structure of this tree. And it said that a goat herder woman, a girl, actually a young girl, was walking by the tree and she thought that Siddhartha was actually a yaksha, a tree spirit, because it didn't, he didn't look human and he looked to be sort of part of the tree. And so a normal thing to do was to make offerings to auspicious trees that might contain yakshas, that might contain tree spirits. So she had a bowl of milk and offered it to the tree spirit. But this was actually Siddhartha. And Siddhartha had just had this realization about the middle path. So for him, it was all very coincidental in that sense. And so the story is, is that he drank the milk. Now that's what was is being referenced here. <clears throat> so when the Bodhisattva, why did he reach the Bodhi tree after he had eaten? and was full of energy and not when he was emaciated and weak. Well, Bodhi, let me tell you, the Bodhisattva could have attained supreme enlightenment, even if he had eaten and drunk nothing and had so had become feeble, let alone, <clears throat> excuse me, let alone when he had taken a grain of sesame or rice daily. At that time, out of compassion for sentient beings in the future, the Bodhisattva ate the wonderful food offered to him by the goat herder girl. Why? Because if sentient beings who wish to seek the path when their roots of goodness are still immature 
if they suffer hunger and thirst as a result of eating and drinking nothing, they cannot obtain wisdom. But if they practice the Dharma peacefully and happily, they can obtain wisdom. In order to make it clear that the Dharma does not demand austerities, the Bodhisattva showed sentient beings that he obtained wisdom by practicing the Dharma peacefully and happily. Also, out of compassion for beings in the future, the Bodhisattva wished to cause them to take good food, just as he had. Therefore, he appeared to achieve the 37 ways to awakening and to attain supreme enlightenment only after having eaten the food given to him by the woman Sujata. This woman, by the way, the goat herder, she also achieved the 37 ways to awakening. And furthermore, the Bodhisattva was blissful even when in the first dhyana and could abide in it without taking food for hundreds of thousands of kalpas. This was all just an upaya practiced by the bodhisattva. <clears throat> All right. So we're not quite at the Bodhi tree yet. We're, this was right before that. So I think, you know, that's an important message. And it's always been a part of the Buddhist message, I, I, I should mention. It's not really just a Mahayana thing. But this idea that the Dharma does not demand austerities, it's a very important part of the Buddhist tradition. And it's because Buddhism is coming out of a tradition of austerities. And in many ways, Buddhism is coming out of a culture, the Indian uh, kind of pre, you know, um, kind of I wouldn't quite call it ancient India, but it's not modern or medieval, but so, but coming out of this kind of more arcane Indian culture, the, the this idea of transcending the world, this idea of escaping samsara, at the time of the Buddha, the only way anybody thought that you could possibly do that was through austerities. So, the Buddha and Buddhism is unique with this message that this is a tradition that leads to moksha, that leads to liberation, but that doesn't demand austerities. And again, that's part of the middle path idea. And of course, that middle path, you know, there's so many examples of it, but, you know, the classic example is that idea that rather than fasting and starving and rather than the all-you-can-eat buffet of the palace, the Buddha suggested, how about one meal a day? One big meal in the afternoon, and then we're good, right? <laughs> so that was sort of the middle path between fasting and indulging. Also, by the way, before the Buddha, it was very common, still is in India, for wandering ascetics, it was common for them to be naked, to for them not to have any clothing, total nature children, right, out in the woods. So it austerities, it's about being naked. Of course, when you're living it up in the palace, it's about, you know, phew, you have you have different clothes for every meal, right? So rather than having a different set of clothes for every meal, and rather than being naked, how about a nice set of robes to wear? <laughs> Same set of robes every day, but you will be clothed. So that was an aspect of the middle path for early Buddhism, at least, was to have robes rather than being naked. Uh, I could go on and on about the way that the middle path manifests itself in the Buddhist tradition. But the key is, is that Buddhism is not a tradition that demands austerities. So, any questions or ideas about that first part? Yeah, no. Yeah, I have a question uh, about the idea that, you know, the, the Buddha was reacting 
or had not reacted to it, had been following these very severe austerities uh, as, as you were describing, of sort of renouncing everything in a way that's more extreme than we see in Buddhism. But there's also a, a kind of a contrast that we've been talking about a lot between Hinayana and Mahayana, where Hinayana, we're like, oh, you know, get, stay away from all this stuff. Whereas Mahayana is more like, no, can I be with this stuff and not desire it? So is that, is that just a, a gradation or, you know, do you see what I'm saying? Like, mm-hmm. where do you, what's the difference between those two? Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll offer an answer to that this way. So a couple, actually a couple things come to mind. So a funny story, I think it's a funny story. It's usually told as a funny story, but a funny story about the Buddha is that uh, on his deathbed, so in the Pari Nirvana Sutra, so the sutra that kind of captures all of the last things that the Buddha said as he was sort of dying. In that, one one thing comes up where it has to be Ananda, I'm pretty sure it's Ananda, that asks the Buddha a, a question about some of the rules. And the Buddha basically says, famously says, well, the minor rules, you can kind of, change those or adapt those as 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 needed and then the buddha dies and everybody's like ananda why didn't you ask him what are the minor rules (laughs) so there's this controversy about like that the buddha gave everybody permission in that sense to alter or change the rules but only the minor ones but there's a debate about what the minor ones are I, I, I recount this little anecdote because it speaks to how even the early Buddhist tradition was aware of the ever shifting middle path, that the middle path isn't fixed. And so at the time of the Buddha, it was about wearing a set of robes and the same set of robes for the rest of your life. But as time goes on, that middle path actually moves a little bit. Now, it's still considered the middle path, but it's a slightly different rule. For example, in the higher climates, uh, like in the Tibetan plateau, for example, the monks wear head headgear, they wear hats. But in the original Vinaya, monks were never supposed to cover their shaved, their beautiful shaved head that is an, a sign of their renunciation. It's a sign of their, their status. So you would never cover that. But that's tricky when you're way up in, the, in Tibet. And so they changed the rules to allow for, for that changing. So that's one thing, is that they're aware that the middle path is shifting. But something else comes along to Gnome that I, I always like to point out and mention. And what it is, is, is that the teaching of the middle path, as you may know, and I know most of you here know, in the kind of the early days of Buddhism, the middle path was interpreted seemingly And in in ways that I was describing about comportment, about lifestyle, things like that. But there was a general, like, like, what, what would you call it? It was like a general ethos of the middle path, right? In Buddhism, it was always about avoiding the two extremes, as they would say. And that avoiding the two extremes eventually this middle path ideology, if you will, it becomes the foundation of an, of actually a new school of Buddhist thought. You might know it as the Madhyamaka, the Madhyamaka teachings of Nagarjuna. And the, the Madhyamaka, the middle way, the Madhyamaka of Nagarjuna is very interesting because again, it's taking the middle path ethos 
and applying it even further. And what I'm getting at, Noam, is that what happens in Mahayana Buddhism because of Nagarjuna Manyamaka thought is that there is this realization that the duality between monastic person and lay person is a extreme division. And that's where the Bodhisattva path is considered this middle way, even between monasticism and lay laicism, if you if you will. And that's where the Bodhisattva, who is ever on the middle path, sort of observes the ethics of a monk <laughs> while also being in a way uh, amenable to the things of the world in that sense. And so that sort of explains a little bit too in that way. So those are a couple of answers, Noam. Thank you. Those are really helpful. Oh, good. All right. So that's our opener about the middle path and not demanding austerities in that way. Ah. So now we've arrived at the Bodhi tree, but we have one step, one little step. I've never really heard this one before. And so it, since I've never heard of it, you might not have heard of it too, too. So let me share it. The next question is, why did the Bodhisattva, so Siddhartha, why did the Bodhisattva ask the God called auspiciously peaceful for grass to cover his seat? Well, it was because former Buddhas did not cover the seat of liberation with fine silken fabric, and also because the Bodhisattva wished to help the god auspiciously peaceful achieve the 37 aids to awakening. After the god gave the grass to the bodhisattva, <clears throat> the god auspiciously peaceful brought forth bodhicitta, so made the vow to become a bodhisattva. I now predict that that god auspiciously peaceful will, in a future life, become a Buddha named pure tathagata, worthy one, supremely enlightened one. But this was all just the upaya practiced by the bodhisattva. So a little anecdote about the Buddha or Siddhartha asking a god for a little bit of grass to cover his seat, not wanting to cover it with fine silks and things like that. So um, yeah, not much to really say about that one. And then of course, the Buddha only did that, only asked for the grass for the benefit of the god so that they might generate bodhicitta. And by the way, since it's come up twice so far, I will mention it if you've never heard of this. In the Mahayana tradition, in a lot of these sutras, you will often hear reference to the 37 aids to awakening. And I just want you to know that this is sort of a, it's an important, I find this is a very important thing to mention about these Mahayana sutras. So the 37 aids to awakening, you actually probably know them, but you might not know them all grouped together like that. What it is, is, is that in the Mahayana tradition, they summarize the you could call it the Visuddhi Maga, the path of purification. They call it the aids to awakening. But it's these, well, it's the path as you would know it. So what I'm referring to is, is the four right efforts, the four foundations of mindfulness, the four bases of spiritual power, the five spiritual faculties, the five spiritual powers, the seven factors of enlightenment, and the eightfold noble path. If you add all those dharmas together, it's a list of 37, and they're all from the early form of Buddhism. Again, it's just that the early, the Hinayana doesn't group them in this list of 37, at least not that I've found. 
but the Mahayana does. And I wanted to dwell on this for a moment about the 37 aids to awakening. I haven't said this recently. It's something that I used to say more often in the past. It's about how these Mahayana sutras, I know that if you're used to Hinayana practices, if you're used to the Theravada, like the insight mindfulness tradition in, in the United States, I know that if you're used to that type of Buddhism and then you read these sutras, they can sound, you know, a little wild, a little, you know, insert the adjective, <laughs> really. Just, they can seem very different. And I think something that gets missed is that these sutras are still extolling the virtues of certain practices, such as the four foundations of mindfulness, an essential Buddhist practice of meditation. In fact, it is the essential Buddhist practice of meditation, mindfulness of the body, mindfulness of sensations, mindfulness of mind, mindfulness of dharmas. That progress, those four foundations, that's the way to do it. Putting forth the right effort, the four right efforts, that's, all, that's always been the way, or, you know, the exertion of effort to the four foundations of mindfulness. My point is, is that these Mahayana sutras, they're kind of like, they're basically, what's tricky about them is that they presume that you know all this other dharma <laughs> and that you're steeped in it. And now we're just going to get you excited about practicing that meditation and, and putting forth the effort. There's nothing new being presented here in that way. It's, it, it's actually just kind of window dressing for the Dharma in that way. So I just wanted to stress that, that when you hear language like the 37 aids to awakening, they are talking about the eightfold path, the seven factors of awakening, the classic methods to enlightenment. So, all right. So that's just a note about that. All right. Now let's get to it. So now the Buddha or Siddhartha or the Bodhisattva is now sitting under the Bodhi tree. The question is, when the Bodhisattva sat under the Bodhi tree, why did the bodhisattva cause Papion, the demon king, to attempt to prevent his attainment of supreme enlightenment? So this is this is this is a the twist I was talking about at the beginning of tonight's talk. So in the traditional way this story is told. Siddhartha is a human, is a person just like you and I. And so when the Buddha makes this determination to become awakened, finds the Bodhi tree, makes a vow not to get up from sitting under the Bodhi tree until they've achieved awakening or died trying, then something happens, which is that this being so the being goes by the name of either Papian or Mara. The evil one is sometimes, or the, the demon king, the king of demons. All of these are names for Mara. And in the traditional story of the Buddha's awakening, Mara comes rushing to the site of enlightenment, comes rushing to the Bodhi tree to attempt to stop Siddhartha from transcending samsara because samsara that's Mara's realm now let me tell you something about Mara I've been on a big kick lately about kind of of explaining or teaching the story of Buddhism as this so Mara that word means 
death. And so Mara in Buddhism is this creature. He's not presented as a human form. He's presented as a creature. But this creature, Mara, the name means death because Mara is a personification of death. But the way that I think of Mara, it's not, you know, you could get, you can get real uh, sci-fi fantasy about this, just like happens in, in the Christian tradition. You have this kind of character in the Bible or a figure in the Bible of a kind of devil being. But then even in Christianity, the devil becomes like this sci-fi fantasy vampire evil person that lurks around. And the same thing happens in Buddhism where there's this idea of this death being that then becomes personified and then can even become a kind of a figure, like a devil. But as I've studied Buddhism, the way that they talk about Mara, it's more about Mara is all beings fear of dying, personified. <laughs> so, all sentient beings, and remember, Buddhism is always talking about the suffering of all sentient beings, not just human beings, but all sentient beings. And the idea is, is that all sentient beings, now this is probably, probably some aspect of evolutionary biology, which is that all sentient beings have a fear of dying. And it's probably a good thing that they do because they might not have made it very long if they didn't have such a fear, right? Because if it's just like, hey, what's in that dark, scary cave full of fire? Let me go find out. That creature might not have reproduced, right? Whereas the one that had a certain sense of self-preservation and a sort of like, I don't think I want to go in the fire cave, then they may have made it a little further in life and reproduced and so on and so forth. So as I've said with many things about Buddhism, Buddhism recognizes that creatures like us, sentient beings, are programmed, you know, call it evolutionary biology, call it whatever, the design, but they're, we are programmed in a lot of different ways. We are programmed to fear death in that way. We are programmed to reproduce and crave sexuality. That's a part of the program. We are programmed to get angry. You can see it in all sentient beings that if you get too close or start doing something they don't like, they growl, they bare teeth, they get angry. So it's very common. It's very part of the program to get angry, to be desirous, to be sexually stimulated, and to fear death. All of this is very normal. What the Buddha seems to have realized, though, is that all of these programs are running in the background, and they're driving us crazy. And there's techniques for actually transcending the program. If I, I would say that, I would kind of put it upayakly in that way. And so the idea is, is that given that, that there's this program to get angry, program to be desirous, all of these programs, the Buddha seems to, or Buddhism, I should say, seems to be suggesting that that, that death, that fear of death, that specter of death that kind of looms, that seems to be the big one. And I say that because the Buddha becomes awakened after defeating Mara. And the way that I interpret that story of a Buddha defeats Mara under the Bodhi tree, I take that to mean that a, an awakened being overcomes the programmed fear of death under the Bodhi tree, under the tree of awakening. 
Okay, so that's the story of Mara. Now, normally the idea is, is that the Buddha is a person under the Bodhi tree trying to escape suffering, old age, death, and all of that. But this specter of death is challenging the Buddha and is sitting there looming, basically being like, ha, 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 you're not going to get away from me. You're not going to escape my, you know, the dread of me in that way. Now, again, in the normal way this story is told, <laughs> the Buddha is just a normal person trying to defeat Mara, and Mara is doing Mara's best to stop him. But this sutra puts it a little differently, right? This is, oh yeah, why did the Bodhisattva sit under the Bodhi tree and cause Mara to come try to stop him? <laughs> In interesting twist let's find out more so mara the demon king could not approach the bodhi tree by his own power it would have been absolutely impossible for him to do so if the bodhisattva had not summoned him kulaputra noble child the Bodhisattva thought when sitting under the Bodhi tree, who is supreme, the most honored one in the four continents? To whom do the four continents belong? Immediately, the Bodhisattva knew that Papian, the evil one, the demon king, was the most honored one in the realm of desire. The Bodhisattva thought, now, if I battle with Mara, the demon king, and he loses, it will prove that he and all the sentient beings in the realm of desire are inferior to me. At that time, a, mul at that time, a multitude of gods came together to the Bodhi tree and engendered faith in the, tree, in the three jewels the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, when they arrived. Gods, demons, nagas, ghosts, spirits, gandharavas, asuras, garudas, kinyaras, mahoragas, will then encircle the Bodhi tree. Some of them will bring forth supreme bodhicitta, some will aspire to become bodhisattvas, and some will engender faith in the three jewels. When they see me perform the lion's sport, some will even achieve liberation just because they see me. Kulaputra. With this thought in mind, the Bodhisattva emitted from the white curl of hair between his brows a light, which outshone the palace of Papian, the evil one. At that time, every corner of this billion-fold world universe became very bright because of the brilliance of the light from the Buddha's brow. From that light came this voice. The child of the Sakya clan, who has left the household life to learn the path, will now attain supreme enlightenment. He will transcend the realm of demons, overcome Mara, overcome demons, and will decrease the number of demons in the future. Now he is fighting with Papian, the demon king. Kulaputra, having heard the voice, Papian, the evil one, became extremely worried and felt as if an arrow had been shot into his heart. Then he ordered his four kinds of soldiers marching in a file 36 miles across to come besiege the Bodhi tree in order to cause the Bodhisattva trouble. At that time, the Bodhisattva abided in great kindness, great compassion, and great wisdom. By virtue of his wisdom, he beat the ground with his golden-hued hand 
and soon the demons dispersed. After the demons had been dispersed, 8 trillion, 400 billion gods, nagas, ghost spirits, Gandharavas, Asuras, Garudas, Kinaras, Maharagas, and Kumbhambandas, and so forth, all brought forth supreme bodhicitta. Because they saw the awesome virtue, the exquisite body, the handsome features, and dauntless strength of the bodhisattva. But this was all just an upaya practiced by the bodhisattva. Okay, so I want to fill in a few things. Um, as I've mentioned in um, last Sunday and the Sunday before, I love telling the story of Siddhartha. I love all these little points along the way. And this, this retelling of the defeat of Mara, they sort of just gloss over it really quickly because they're trying to make this point that it was all a big plan of the Buddha. Like it wasn't that Mara really even stood a chance. So I won't dwell so much on that upayak aspect of the story, but I do want to kind of tell you, because you may not have heard it, you might not have heard it from me, but the way that the story of Siddhartha is normally told, the way that I tell it, is that Mara, death, the evil one, is in this attempt to get the Bodhisattva to not become awakened, Mara takes three different attempts at defeating the Buddha. The first attempt is kind of what's spoken about here. And it's where Mara creates this giant army and they are all um, archers. And Mara himself strings a bow with a thousand arrows. So he has this giant army of archers and a thousand arrowed bow. <clears throat> and then they launch all at once. These uncountable number of arrows come flying at the Buddha. And the story goes that the Buddha performed a mudra, a hand gesture. And this hand gesture is this one called the abhaya, sorry, abhaya, the A-B-H-Y-A, -A, which means the fearlessness mudra. It's palm straight out. And uh, performing the mudra of fearlessness, it is said that the arrows all turned to flowers and just rained over the Buddha's body. Now, the idea here is, is that these three attempts at stopping Siddhartha correspond to the three poisons, the three kleshas. And so the first klesha, anger, is what we're talking about. Anger, violence, uh, fear is part of that as well. The kind of the complex of fear and anger, right? That's this first klesha. And so the idea is, is that shooting all these arrows at the bodhisattva, this is about, you know, challenging his life, fear, maybe even trying to get the, the bodhisattva to defend himself in that way, to shoot arrows back, to fight, basically. Like he's just, tr he's trying to get the Buddha to either fight or die in that way. And so without a word, with just this gesture, the Buddha overcomes, well, it's not just with <laughs> a gesture, but the gesture is symbolic of overcoming that klesha of anger and the fear wrapped up in it. So then, having defeated that, Mara takes another approach. And in the story, as I've heard it told, Mara manifests like 
in in the the story as I originally heard it, Mara manifests like a blonde, a brunette, a redhead, you know, basically different females. You could include into that just all different ki kinds of beautiful people that Mara tries to entice the bo the bodhisattva out of his meditation. So not trying to cajole him or scare him out of it, but trying to tempt him with lust, trying to tempt him with sexual desire. Now, once again, the bodhisattva makes a gesture, makes a mudra that counteracts this defilement of desire, the klesha of desire, and in this case, sexual desire. And the mudra is one where the hand is on the lap with the hand facing out and down. This is a gesture of dana. This is a gesture of generosity, a gesture of giving, right? And so the idea is, is rather than taking the taking sexuality in that way, rather than taking what was being offered, the Buddha turns it around and actually offers generosity towards those that are tempting him. So again, rather than taking, the Buddha responds with giving. And this is said to sort of make the uh, sexual temptation disappear in that way. In most stories, the, the temptresses or the tempters turn to uh, salt or sand and disappear. So, so those are two kleshas, anger and greed. There's only one more major klesha or major affliction left, and that is confusion or delusion. But remember in Buddhism, the third affliction about confu moha, confusion, it's kind of specifically confusion about the nature of the self. That's kind of specifically what we are confused about or deluded about. So rather than arrows and rather than sexual temptation, the third attempt of Mara is actually about, it's, it's kind of this challenge of pride, ego. And what it is is, is Mara basically says, all right, fine. You can, you can leave, you can escape samsara, but you got to tell me like why you're qualified to escape. Like, let's see your credentials <laughs> in that way. Like, what are your accomplishments? Like, and so, you know, the, the, this one gets told a lot of different ways, but it's this challenge for the Buddha to speak on his own behalf and in a way tout, tout his own accomplishments. Rather than saying anything like before, though, the Buddha or the Bodhisattva, I should say, makes another mudra hand gesture. And this time, it's not the gesture of giving, but the hand is this way, also at the base of the legs, the Buddha sitting full lotus crossed, cross-legged. And this is where the hand, the fingers are touching the earth. So right at the knee, touching the ground. This is called the Bhumi Sparsha Mudra, the, the gesture of touching the earth. And when the Buddha performed the gesture of touching the earth, the goddess of the earth, this kind of uh, Gaia figure, they don't call her Gaia, that's a European Western name, but the, this idea of the goddess of the earth arises out of the earth and basically says that, it, she says something to the effect that, you know, I'm the goddess of the earth and that I have a memory. My memory contains all ages. And she proceeds to basically say, or she bears witness for the Bodhisattva. 
and says, I bear witness that this Bodhisattva has been on the path for lifetime after lifetime after lifetime. And so I vouch for him that he's done the requisite work and has, you know, kind of earned the right to escape samsara. So that's sort of this interesting way, which again, the Buddha does not speak from ego. He does not even speak for himself in that way. And that's sort of the final defeat of Mara. And so if you ever see those gestures of either the fearlessness mudra, the gesture of giving, or the earth touching mudra, they correspond to these kind of important moments in the awakening story of the Bodhisattva. There's a fourth mudra that I would like to point out too that goes along with this, which is the dhyana mudra. So this is the mudra of this hand, right hand and left hand with the thumbs touching, creating that kind of oval at the navel or actually at the dantian, sort of just below your navel. So that's the general gesture of meditation, dhyana meditation specifically. And then, so it's basically after this mudra, this mudra, and that mudra, the Buddha then moves into this mudra, and it's through a night of dhyana and samadhi meditation that the Buddha eventually achieves buddhi, awakening. So that's the longer version of the story. A, the Buddha become, or I should say, a Buddha becomes awakened upon defeating Mara and the temptation of anger, desire, and delusion. So, all right, any questions about that? Just a couple more things to say, but everybody feeling okay about what's going on? Cool. So, one more thing to add, a very important thing. So you may have noticed, I thought this was actually a very interesting section, but what I just read, where, so the Buddha is sitting there thinking, who's the most honored of the four continents, right? Who's the most supreme? And it's interesting that Mara is the most honored and most supreme of the four continents. But they clarify, of course, that he is the most honored one within the realm of desire, right? And I kind of want to, and this will be, this is going to be important for the next one. So as you know, and you definitely know this if, you, if you've been studying with me, but it's a big, important part of the Buddhist tradition to understand the difference between the realm of desire, the realm of form, and then the formless realm. So these are these three kind of levels or layers to reality, and the Buddhists are always talking about them. They're talking about this realm of desire, right? And this is the realm of like, you know, craving and wanting and beauty and ugly and good and bad and all of these kind of psychological projections on the world whether it's about aesthetic value or use value or ethical value but just all of this realm in which we want this but don't want that all of that that's the realm of desire and mara the evil one is the most honored among this realm. But then just underneath that, so to speak, underneath that psychic projection is just the world of form, the rupa datu, just the realm of the four elements, just the world in terms of earth, water, fire, and air. Nothing to get excited about, nothing to desire. <laughs> It's just different degrees of density, liquidity, temperature, and movement, right? So now that the Buddha has defeated the most honored among the realm of desire and has now 
in the mudra, the dhyana mudra is now moving into dhyanic states and dhyanas are, you can only be in the realm of form if you're in a dhyana. You can't have desire and be in a dhyana. You're in the realm of desire if you're having desires in that way. So the Buddha moves into that realm of form. And now check this out. This is our next question. Why did the Tathagata now? Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Where'd you go? Ah, uh, yeah. So they shift it to the Tathagata because he is a Buddha now. This is no longer a Bodhisattva. He has defeated Mara and is a Tathagata. <clears throat> so the question is why did the Tathagata, the Buddha, Remain sitting cross-legged, looking up at the Bodhi tree without blinking for seven days and seven nights. Ulaputra. At that time, there were some gods in the realm of form who were cultivating ultimate quiescence. They were very glad to see the Tathagata sitting cross-legged, and they thought, Now, let us try to find out what the Shramana Gautama's mind rests on. The gods could not locate a single thought in the Tathagata's mind after seven days and seven nights of searching, so they became doubly joyful. 32,000 of them brought forth supreme bodhicitta and made this vow. We will, in a future life, achieve such quiescence that we can look up at a bodhi tree in exactly the same way. Hence, after the Tathagata attained the path, he remained sitting cross-legged, looking up at the bodhi tree without blinking for seven days and seven nights. And this was all the Tathagata's Upaya. Okay. So, a couple of things going on there. <clears throat> so, the basic that we heard is that for a week, seven days, seven nights, the Buddha staring up at the Bodhi tree, unblinking. Yeah. So, interestingly, in the story, what happens is, is that there's these gods that abide in the realm of form. And they see the form of the body of the Tathagata sitting under the Bodhi tree, staring up at it for seven days without blinking. And so they go, ooh, let's find out what he's thinking about. Let's find out what his, like, what is the object of his meditation? What's the focus point of his meditation? And search as they might, they couldn't find a single thing that the Tathagata's mind was settled on. Now, basically, this kind of points to the Tathagata not being in the realm of form the mind of the Tathagata at that point is not in the realm of form, is not abiding in or on anything in the realm of form. And it is a part of the Mahayana tradition. I feel like I've even found a reference to this in the Pali Canon. So it might be just a whole part of the Buddhist tradition. But what you hear about is there this this week, this week, the, the first week during which the Buddha had just become awakened. Now, I haven't, except for this sutra, I hadn't heard it expressed as not blinking for seven days and seven nights, but that kind of adds up or it matches to what you normally hear, which is that the Buddha was in a very particular samadhi a very particular meditative state 
during that first week of awakening, that meditative state, that samadhi, is called, it has a long Sanskrit name, but it's basically just called the ocean-like samadhi. And the ocean-like samadhi is, well, you need to understand, of course, that a samadhi is a very deep state of meditation that is normally characterized by a non-dual state. And by non-dual, what we mean is, is that when we start meditation, whenever there's a, a, a meditation going to go on or something, it always begins where there's somebody who's going to be meditating and something that they're going to meditate upon. And that, of course, is a duality where there's me and it, whatever it is, subject and object. But the idea, the trick, is that you can actually focus your attention on an object. It could be anything, really. And through the focusing of that object, so there's the meditator meditating on the object, but through prolonged periods of sustained attention, unwavering, undistracted attention on an object, you can be basically brought into a deep meditative state called a samadhi in which the distinction between subject and object dissolves. And there is no longer a sense of there being somebody meditating on something. There is just a collapsing into a sense of union, oneness, a lot of descriptions. This gets very obviously very difficult to describe in language, which is dualistic by nature. But the idea is, is that a samadhi, any samadhi, is by definition in a non-dual state where there is no subject, no object. And that's what seems to be being described by the sutra, where the gods were going around trying to find what the Buddha was meditating on, and they couldn't find anything that his mind was on. And that seems to indicate that he was no longer in the realm of form where there is a subject and an object. And so we are to presume that he was in this samadhi state. And indeed, the tradition speaks about it being specifically the ocean-like samadhi. Now, the ocean-like samadhi is a particular flavor of samadhi because the particular flavor of oneness, they say it's like the ocean and then the waves on the surface of the ocean. And if you haven't heard this before, it's a pretty classic, it's a pretty classic spiritual uh, idea. But the idea is, You've got, these are waves, I'm drawing a light pencil here. So these are the waves. And this of course is all the ocean. And the idea is, is that this wave might be me. And this wave might be you. And here I am looking out at through space, through separation, I'm looking out at you. And maybe this is a chair. But the idea is, is that it appears as if there's distinct objects, but they are actually all just arising out of the same ocean. <laughs> so there is a classic kind of ocean-like analogy in spirituality where I am looking out at you or I'm looking out at my computer or I'm looking out at my teacup and there's subject and object. But the ocean-like samadhi is this realization of, oh, no, there, it's all ocean and I'm a wave and this is a wave and you're a wave and we're all these 
differentiated waves on the surface, but underneath it's all the same ocean. And so this ocean-like samadhi is one in which all the objects of the world are now seen as just these kind of superficial wave formations on the surface of a much more vast ocean underneath. Specifically, I want you to be feeling how that kind of view of reality where individuated objects are no longer individuated, they're just waves, including the experiencer, including the meditator. I just want you to feel how that's a kind of, um, it has a certain sense or a feeling of oneness. Just that one big ocean in that way, where all of these individuations are just kind of, again, superficial on the surface in that way. So the Buddha is supposedly in this ocean-like samadhi for a week. And then during that week is when these godlings go running around trying to find where the Buddha's mind is focused. But they can't find it. All right, questions, comments, answer, answers, ideas. There's been a lot of ideas tonight, a lot of topics. So anything come up? Yeah, Noe. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Perfect. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, going back to the first part of the talk. Um, yeah, just wonderful. This is why I take care of myself. <laughs> this is why I eat right, try to eat right, try to exercise, try to get good sleep, definitely practice, uh, not for myself, but for others, for, 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 for yeah, this, this Bodhisattva path of like, oh, and such a great uh, um, example <laughs> to follow. Yeah. So I just wanted to say thank you for that. And Buddhism is the example. Yeah, exactly. Thanks, all. Oh, thanks, Noe. By the way, I will say, I, I will mention this as far as, far as my um, kind of the, in terms of like what I'm trying to say here, like these last few classes. So one important thing that I, and you know, I'm speaking very personally now as far as how I understand these things. But for me, what's important about the way that we're talking about this tonight, the way that we're looking at it, the way that we're thinking about it, for me, what's important is when, something like the story of Siddhartha, for example, when it is presented as this kind of historical fact or like historical reality versus a story like we're studying it tonight, when it's presented more as like a historical event, that can lead to a certain way of thinking. And what I mean is, when we hear the story of Siddhartha, we can think that enlightenment happens like in a day, that you defeat Mara like in an evening, <laughs> you overcome anger, desire, and delusion like in the course of just an evening. And that's where I think a story like this, if it's taken too literally, can become, it's unfortunate because what I, I guess what I'm getting at is, is that sitting under the Bodhi tree and defeating Mara and becoming awakened, it can be like a lifetime process of sitting under the Bodhi tree, battling with Mara in that way. And so as I've been trying to present the archetypal Bodhisattva journey, and as I've been trying to kind of alter, not alter it, but present it in this way where every bodhisattva will leave home, what that looks like will differ depending upon each bodhisattva. It might, for some, it might literally be 
shaving their head and wearing robes. But for others, it might be, you know, more psychological in that way. Well, in the same way, I want to express that part of the archetypal bodhisattva journey is eventually sitting under the Bodhi tree and then battling with Mara. And if you kind of were here last week and you heard what I was saying about that, or even at the beginning of tonight's talk, where I was talking about that moment when the practitioner has decided that they're kind of good, I'm, I'm done or I'm good with the worldly things and I'm ready to start taking very seriously my cultivation or my practice. You've left home. <laughs> like that transition is, is leaving home. I would also then suggest that there's a moment in every bodhisattva's life when they start battling Mara. Because Mara is a formidable enemy in that way. And so there's this moment where rather than sort of going along with Mara, as they will say, kind of going along with the affairs of Mara, or just sort of like avoiding Mara, right? Like we're not in, we're not like hanging out at Mara's house on the weekends anymore, but, you know, we're still just sort of ignoring Mara. There's a moment though, when the Bodhisattva actually starts battling with Mara. And I would suggest that that's the moment when the Bodhisattva has sat under the Bodhi tree. And it's like, they are actually about to start the process of defeating Mara. And how long does that take? Again, I think it'll vary depending on each Bodhisattva. So, all right, everybody, unless there's any last minute comments, questions, ideas, or insights, or epiphanies, we, we've gotten to where I wanted to stop this evening. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, Maria. Oh, no, oh, you're muted again. You weren't for a second, but now... <laughs> There you go. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that I really appreciate this um, interpretation or retelling of the story because it allows me to um, see in a fresh way these things in my path. So yes, that did that. Yes, I can see that. <laughs> um, so that sort of thing. Um, it's it's really great. So thank you. Oh. Cool. Excellent. Wonderful. That makes me very happy to hear. All right. Um, then I'll pass it over to Gnome and the center. See if there's anything going on there.